until <laughs> until 10 till and then wake me up so I can go to lab and sleep up there. All right. Um, so I did actually get in to see the president, which was good. Uh, and then we had our mobile software meeting, which, you know, almost got lost in the shuffle of my head. You know what I mean? It's like I was so focused on, on that that it was like, oh yeah, I have that to do today too. And now this class. So um, it should go well. All right. Um, our issue again that, that we're coming back to and we're going to investigate um, a few um, other methods for deployment. And we're focusing now on where applications where the deployment is done on the server and the clients access them via a web browser. And again, to, to review what we've done in the past classes, our client, which would be to make an install based on a jar, more than likely. We have a mix of client and server. And that would be either the Java Web Start or applets. And then finally, all server, which would be JSP, which stands for Java Server Pages, or Java Servlets. Servlet, I think, being, um, you know, a takeoff on the word applet. You know, it's a... It, an applet is an application that lives on a web page. A servlet is a little program on the server that makes a web page. So I think that's, that's where that terminology comes from. Again, um, <clears throat> this has the advantage of um, you only need to deploy it on the server. In fact, if you look at this, there's really sort of two dimensions that we, we can look at. Um, there is the, the, the question of, where it's deployed, one server versus multiple clients, and then there's a question of the client requirements. Um, minimal, only browser, or more involved JRE, the Java runtime engine. So when we talk about installing a program, obviously we're installing it on multiple clients then. If we're talking about this, the traditional, I'm doing it all on the client and we create a, a jar and install it. Then we're deploying it on every client. All right, And each client has to have a more involved JRE. Uh, or more involved uh, um, machine, uh, more involved cli uh, client. Because it has to have the J JRE. So there, there's more, um, I won't say restrictions, but there, there, there's steeper requirements for the machine because it has to be running the JRE. Applets and JWS, generally speaking, only has to be deployed on the server, but the client still needs to be a JR, you know, still be running the JRE. <clears throat> so like the all client solution is these two, the mix solutions are these two, and then finally the all server solution is this, the, the, these two. All right. With Java servlets and JSP pages, um, the only requirement of the client is that it runs a web browser. And all the action takes place on the server. So that's the only machine that needs to be able to run Java. That's the only um, machine where the application needs to be deployed. All right. In a nutshell, when we talked about servlets versus JSP, we said that JSP is essentially an HTML document that contains Java code. And we said that a servlet is essentially a Java class 
that outputs HTML. <clears throat> it's my understanding again that when they're compiled, they pretty much compile to work the same way. Um, so it's largely a, a style difference. Let's look at Angel at a resource that I, I actually just posted before class that shows uh, a couple of things that we're going to do today, but first of all, we're going to look at JSP and servlets. All right, this is from the excellent set of, I, li I generally like O'Reilly books. You could probably read this book on Safari Online. Um, are you all aware of Safari Online? Safari Online is a service that, um, since we're here on campus, um, any machine here on campus would, would work for it. Um, if you're at home, you have to enter in your LC library card number. But what it is, is it, it has full text versions of a lot of different IT uh, related books. So if we go to Lorraine Community's library page, and go under research databases, I used to know where everything was until they rearranged their page. Research databases. If you go under S, the first one on the list is Safari Books Online. And you can click on that. And it recognizes that we are on LC's campus, so you go right in there. If you were off campus, I think you can still access, but you have to give your library card number. Not your student number, but your library card number. Now, let's see if this book is here. Java Cookbook. And sure enough, oh, there's a Java SOA cookbook. All right. Um, and here's a regular plain old Java cookbook. So you can go and you can read this book online. It's a little awkward to read online in, the, in this mode. Um, it'd be great if they ever created like a mobile app that you could use on an iPad or something. Um, but what I suggest for many students to do is if you're looking for books, this is at the very least is a good way to sort of try them out. You know, if, if you wanted to buy a book about Java, for example, you know, you could go in the bookstore um, and, and, and look uh, until they kick you out or whatever. All right. Or you can go and you can read at least enough of it to see, you know, does it look like it's a book that is uh, of the kind that, that, that you would like and, and, and that would be meaningful to you. So. I suggest people to use this for like auditioning books. So a lot of times if someone comes up to me and, and asks for a book on a particular topic, I encourage them to go here and take a sampling of them. And that's, that's better than just judging by, by the cover that you'd see uh, on Amazon or whatever. You can, actually, you can actually read as much of the book as you want. And if you're just looking up a few things, you know, you might be able to find your answer right there. At any rate, Here's an example of some servlets. All right. And you can read the details of it um, on your own. But this is the simple hello servlet, hello world servlet. And notice again, you have your imports. You have your class, which extends HTTP servlet. Uh, servlet. So all servlets inherit from that servlet. You have a do get method, all right, instead of a main method or instead of the methods that you have associated with an applet. And notice what this does is this sort of creates a pipe out to the client who's requesting this. And there's a bunch of print statements to print some HTML code. Now, this isn't particularly good HTML code, all right. I mean, they do output the content type to tell the browser, hey, you're getting some HTML. And they output an H1 tag that actually has an end H2 tag at the end of it. I just noticed that. Uh, paragraphs without ending tags. Um, I can't go on. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, when you request this from the server, the server is configured such that when you make a request, for it, and this is actually cut off. It should say the full name, hello servlet. The web server is configured such that it knows that when you 
hit that URL, run that servlet, and whatever output that generates gets sent to the browser as a web page. So as you can see, here is the output that you'd get from that. Each of these prints prints out one of the lines. All right, very basic, nothing too um, earth shattering. Here's one that's maybe a little more um, a, a little more involved, where there's there's a servlet to pull out a bunch of terms from a text file. I don't think they show sample output for this one. Pulls out a, a list of dictionary terms. And again, it, they, they do a little better job here. They create their writer to output to the client, and they output the HTML tag, the title tag, the body tag, the H1 tag, which is again ended with an H2 tag, all right, and so on down the line. They even use tables. I'm going to cry. Uh, and then what they do, here's where the fun real, really starts, because you wouldn't write a servlet just to spit out plain old HTML. You'd just make an HTML page for that, right? But look, notice what they've done. They've written code that does something to that file and formats it a certain way. So they take from that terms txt file, they read that file in, they loop through it, that's what this while loop is doing, and for each line in that file, it outputs a chunk of HTML code. So it, uh, it, it, it uh, outputs a, TR, uh, a, a table row that contains a couple of table cells. Here's something where they are generating um, a series of random numbers in a servlet. All right. So you enter in the text box how many random numbers you want, click on the button, and it en then it generates that many random numbers. So for example, if you put in 8, it would, um, it generates these 8 random numbers. Again, notice that and this machine, that's the name of the servlet right here. Um, INTS servlet, servlet is it? And again, when that is called, this is the first initial page, which is the HTML. This is the servlet that processes that form, processes that form data. And again, notice what they do. Do post instead of do get. Those of you that have taken the HTML class know that there's a get and a post method for a form. So when you post a form, you get two objects called to that, the request and the response. All right. In just about every, every server-side web technology, there's a request and a response object. Those objects um, correspond to the request coming from the client to the server and the response coming from the server back to the client. So for example, form data would be coming in as part of the request object. And sure enough, that's what we do with this. We output the regular old HTML, <laughs> including the bad H1 tag. But then we pull from the request object the element from that form. Now notice how many on the HTML form was the name of the text box. Okay? The name of the text box. So this form first displays, you press submit, and then this servlet is called. How do I know this servlet is called? Because the action of the form is to that servlet. So again, it will call this servlet. That servlet grabs the number that was entered on the previous form. It tries to make an integer of it. If not, through the parse uh, int function, if not, throws an exception and displays a little error message. Otherwise, we'll go in and actually generate some random numbers.
So that's the idea of servlets. Again, to repeat, a servlet is a Java class that outputs HTML. Now, what's the point of that? Well, because part of the process of outputting it can involve interacting with a database, interacting with the data that was entered in the form, interacting with other stuff. All right. So again, it's not just spitting out static HTML. The Java code that's in the servlet, besides spitting out that HTML, can do any sort of Java processing, bring in data from a file, uh, hit a database, do calculations, do random generations, call, you know, create objects, call methods on objects, anything that you've done in any of your Java programs can be done from within a servlet. All right? And in that way, the HTML that you get as a result isn't static, but it's dynamic. It will depend, for example, on the contents of a database or the contents of some random operation or the time of day when it was run or whatever. All right? Questions about uh, servlets? All right? Let's scroll down because later on in this page they start talking about Well here's an interesting one. Real interesting one. This application or this servlet actually generates not an HTML file, but it generates a PDF document that can be sent to um, to a browser. And it sets the content type of the response not to an HTML page, but a PDF file. And then it goes in and it has imported the, PD, uh, the PDF classes. And again, it goes in and does its thing and outputs a PDF file uh, for it. So it will send to the browser a PDF file as opposed to a web page. Let's scroll down here till we get to, ah, to JSP pages. JSP um, is uh, Java servlet pages, oh, I'm sorry, Java server pages, which is sort of a takeoff on the Microsoft technology ASP, or active server pages. And again, it shares some general syntax. Uh, with ASP, this being not .NET ASP, but this being sort of old school, pre.NET ASP. So it shares some general syntax with that and with PHP. Mix of HTML and code. Code is executed on the server side, and the results are sent as um, HTML. Here is that random uh, number routine to generate five random numbers instead as a JSP as opposed to a servlet. All right. Person still didn't learn how to properly close an H1 tag. All right. I guess they make up for it by their little joke here. You have a web page that could use a jolt of Java. They were thinking up of all those witticisms so they, they weren't bothered with um, closing their tags right. Again, notice the difference here. This isn't, this doesn't look like a Java program that has some print statements that print some HTML. This looks like an HTML document and oh yeah, by the way, we have these funny little goofy tags. What do those goofy tags represent? They represent that you are no longer in HTML land, you are in Java land. And therefore the code between here and here is treated as Java code by the server. The server will process that code, will execute the code, and will output the result. And outputting the result means effectively adding it to the web page. This is virtually the same if you've done any PHP coding. It's the same sort of style of coding where you have 
an HTML shell for like the static parts of the page. Because if we were to look at any dynamic pages, parts of it are static, right? If we go to any eBay item, all right, um, the headers one, you know, the header looks one way, the navigation's another way, the search box is in a certain location. So even a dynamic pages, portions of it are static, right? Portions of it are dynamic. Well, what JSP does is you pop out of HTML into Java to uh, execute the Java statements, and that's what gives the dynamic uh, effect of it. And again, that can involve calling, you know, hitting a database or doing any kind of processing that you can do uh, within Java. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, in, in generally speaking, how web servers process any of these um, um, server-side code, like this, this or PHP, is they sort of parse down here, all right? If it's plain old HTML, it just sends it to the client. So, HTML tag, plain old HTML, send that to the client. Head, HTML tag, send that to the client. Title, send it to the client. When the server hits here, it now knows, hey, we're no longer in HTML land. I'm not going to send this stuff directly to the client. But anything that is printed within here gets sent to the client and gets sent in that space. All right? So in other words, in this case, Notice what we're doing, we're creating an ordered list, and inside this loop, we're outputting an li tag and a random number. All right, so what does that mean? That means within that ordered list, I'm going to get five li tags and five random numbers. Because that code, that Java code, is between the start ol tag and the end ol tag. So therefore, the output of it, the HTML that this generates and outputs, gets put right between the OL and the end OL. All right? Now again, these statements don't get sent to the browser. Those are Java statements. That, that does the work of whatever kind of work is being done. It's the output statements that output. All right? And in particular, what makes this dynamic, where it would be different every time that we ran it, is this line of code is sending to the browser the result of some function call. In this case, a random number function call. All right? Which means that it'll be different each time. So the output that we're going to get is different each time. Now again, this is just a very simple case just to illustrate the concept, but keep in mind that what you're doing here typically is you're going accessing a database and pulling in those values and filling them in there. So if, you, if, if, uh, if eBay was written uh, using JSP pages, that'd be, you know, eBay's header, eBay's general navigation, blah, 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 blah. You would pop into Java mode, you'd retrieve from the database um, the stuff that you needed, uh, for that particular product that you were viewing. And then you would format and display the name of the project, maybe a picture of the project, the, the price, and so on down the line. Here is a nice little thing that generates a calendar, a JSP page. And again, What this does is this accepts from the request object get parameter, which means that the method on the form was get, not post. It grabs the year that you asked for, all right, and then it goes in, creates a calendar for that year, loops through it, and creates a table. for all that stuff to show the calendar.
key thing to remember is in essence both of these technologies uh, end up in the same place. All right, you're mixing Java code and HTML. It's just, is it an HTML file that contains Java code or is it Java code that outputs HTML? Either way, you're ending up, the client, from the client's perspective, you're definitely ending up with the same thing. You're getting an HTML page, all right, because that's what browsers get, right? Remember, there's no Java, no Java in this kind of implementation only restriction or the only requirement is that it has a web browser. So what do web browsers understand? Well, to simplify things, they understand HTML. All right? And therefore, the output that we send them has to be HTML. All right? It's just a matter of do we create a, create a Java class that spits out HTML or do we create an HTML document that has embedded some Java uh, into it. Questions about any of this? Um, maybe the familiarity with the um, with the um, how do I want to say? It, it could be it could be a, a developer's preference. Uh, it could be a mix or match. It's not it's not as though you have to pick one way or another. Um, I'm trying to think, um, it really in, in, the, in the one big Java-based web development that I did, you know, wow, over 10 years ago now, um, we actually had, had a mix of everything. Uh, some of the more intensive processing used servlets, some of the more, um, you know, hey, I'm displaying a web page and maybe spitting some things out, were, were, were just JSP pages. So. Um, Let's, let's, let's see if Google has any insight on this one. I'm, uh, I'm following the advice of, of Sean who spoke today that said you're not the first person to ask these questions. Feel free to, uh, to uh, use Google. Well, boy, gee, this 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 has this this. Oh, I, I guess I should trust my own judgment. This says kind of what I said, but it raises a good point. Serverless should be used if you have more Java than HTML. <laughs> JSP should be used if you have more HTML than Java. And then they say it's very common to, to combine servlets and JSP. So the initial request gets sent to a server which does some Java work and forwards it to a JSP which actually makes the HTML output. All right. One thing I will say is, is for example, if, you, if you're working on a big project, all right, you may have coders, you know, people that know programming languages like Java, and then you might have web designers like HTML folks that know CSS and all that kind of stuff. If you think about in working in that kind of environment, um, a designer can't help you at all with a servlet because they're not going in there and writing Java code. A designer could create an HTML document as a prototype for a JSP page. Let's say, for example, it was a, a search, search of our database for, you know, products. All right. A web designer so, uh, and again, I'm using designer to talk about someone that doesn't have traditional programming skills that, but does know HTML, CSS, and the like. And I'm talking about a coder as someone that really knows, you know, programmer, programming. In an environment like that, a designer could create a prototype of the search in pure HTML that was static. That would say, okay, it's going to have a text box that looks like this. It's going to have a button that looks like this. Here's the output table that's going to look like this. And oh yeah, I'm going to hard code some data in there, all right? And they can make it look perfect, all right? Then it's the programmer's job 
to take that, turn it into a JSP. How do they turn it into a JSP? Well, they yank out the stuff that's static, that shouldn't be static, like for example the hard-coded list of products, and they put the Java code in there that really, really works. That's how I worked on a lot of different projects, all right? You know, and, and it's funny, I, I guess depending on your own biases and preferences, it's kind of like, you know, look at the programmers uh, of the world. Do you want them making aesthetic judgments about how the web page is going to look? Then you ask the opposite question. Look at the graphic designers of the world. Do you think they're up to the task of doing heavy duty Java coding? And I, I say it mockingly, but uh, it's true. You know, web development, to truly do a, a big web development project, really is, is, a, is a mix of a lot of different skills. Right? And it's very rare for someone to be equally skilled across the board. Usually you tend to have strengths and weaknesses and you, you, you might lean towards being more on the programming side or on the, the UI side, the interface side. And the one thing I will say is that the JSP pages would allow you to sort of leverage the skills of those, those two people, uh, or two types of people, if you had uh, on an assignment. But, you know, Something that, and again, I kind of alluded to that, something that's more processing intensive, maybe a servlet, uh, something that was, you know, maybe minimal processing, but still dynamic, uh, be, uh, be a JSP page. Repeat, no, re repeat the question. Or the comment? HTML, Java, and you could have HTML, Java, right? Right. And it just seems to me, that, I don't know why, but it seems to me strange that instead of having that JSP page, you could have like a Java pointing to a file that contains Java. Right, right. That person's going to take that out, put in the Java code, and then play. So they're kind of, you know, tampering with something else that they've created. Instead of inserting it in the file. Yes. Are there any and, questions? And, and, <laughs> they almost have to be, you know, they do have to have some HTML. Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, they, they would have to have, they would have to know the rudiments of HTML to do that. Uh, uh, let me look to see, um, this is something I don't think exists, but let me Google it to find out. Oh, actually I stand corrected. Um, one way around that would be to use a JSP include file. Google that again, and, and that way you would you would uh, you would uh, you'd achieve more of the goal that you're saying, you know. Instead of me altering the HTML, I would put it in an include file, which is like you have in in um, PHP. So in other words, I could have my static HTML and then just have a series of include files to go in there and do that. Uh, that's especially valuable if the stuff in those include files you want to share between pages. But it would have value in the case that you wouldn't run the risk of someone messing around with, with that. You know. um, again, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I'm just trying to give my thoughts on, on based on, on how I did it. That seemed to work well. Every once in a while, you'd get a designer coming over screaming, you screwed up my design, you didn't put an end tag in, correct. you know, you screwed up something HTML-wise. But usually that was less of an issue. Um, it, it didn't turn out to be a huge issue uh, in, in practice. All right. But yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And, and you could achieve that with include files. Um, if that was that was a goal, and again, keep in mind that on smaller projects, you know, you're everything, right? So you would be doing the the HTML and, and the Java and all that, especially if you're doing uh, well, especially if you're doing um, 
Oh, I won't even say that. I was going to say if you're doing JSP, you might be having a, a, a really tangled mess of stuff. But again, um, you could probably still do that in an include file. Questions at this point? Now, what do you need to make this work? We talked about it kind of, you know, looking at the details of a servlet and the details of JSP, but I have a web server on this machine. I just, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to just start cranking out um, JSP pages or Java servlets. Your, your, your web server has to be configured in a certain way in order to do that. Um, for JSP pages, um, typically, the, the, the typical thing is that you are running the Apache web server and you add a, a, a tool called Tomcat or you add a, a, an add-on called Tomcat and Tomcat handles JSP pages allows you to run Java on the web server. Can you run JSP on a Microsoft product? Sure. But typically, again, you know, if you're committed to a Java platform, you probably aren't running the Windows uh, server software, and you're probably running the Apache server, so you probably would be running, um, you probably would be running a, um, a Apache, and then to run JSP pages, you'd add Tomcat to it. Here is a diagram that is pretty good that we can look at. All right. This reiterates one of the points that I made uh, before, that when the day is done, a JSP page and a servlet get treated the same way. All right. Because effectively what Tomcat is, is something that takes JSP and makes a servlet out of it. All right? And then the Java compiler is built into the um, uh, web server, and the Java runtime engine will execute, that serv uh, uh, will execute that servlet and go and send a response to the client. In this diagram, this guy is the client. All these other steps happen on the server. And notice what they say is that the translation occurs at this point if the JSP has been changed or is new. So in other words, they're not, comp they're not doing a translation of the JSP page into a servlet uh, every time. They're only doing it if it needs to be done. All right. Then the compiler is, the, the, the server is, config, is configured to see the, uh, or to be able to compile Java stuff. It, so the Java compiler is configured to be embedded with the server, as they say. And again, that produces a class that can be um, sent over. Right. Questions. We have two choices, all right, of what to do now. Probably have a lot more, but we'll talk about two of them. One of them is to call it a day in lecture and then go up the lab and work on our lab stuff. The other is to go on for another 10, 15 minutes um, and hit some of the last couple of topics that I have 
And then Monday next week would be an all work day. So we would go up there to lab at 8 o'clock and, and, and do that. Which would you prefer doing? Do we have any votes for either of the two options? You want to head up the lab? Okay. Other preferences? That fine? Yes. Yeah, but, but if I lecture on Monday, I'm not going to go the full 50 minutes. So you'll get that anyhow. You, you know what I'm saying? So I, let's say I go 20 minutes, then you'll get a half hour. Let's just break for lab now. All right. I'm tired. <laughs> Had a long day. We'll do that.